So I sat in this room and something in my head said, get the fuck out of here right now. And the other side of my head said, no, be cool, stay here. Seven minutes to midnight and I heard the door open. So I stood up and I pulled my mask down and I peered around the corner and I could see these two brace guards coming in with a, a dolly loaded up with gray bags filled with money. And I thought, yep, here we go. And I stepped out of the room, and the, the first Brinks guard, who was actually armored, he looked at me, and his eyes went huge like saucers. He, I'll never forget these brown eyes. Yeah. And I'm standing there, and before I can say anything, he draws his pistol and immediately fires. Well, I immediately reacted, and I started pouring bullets over Paul's head. I had a bead on his chest. I had him dead to rights with that rifle. This is the One Soldier Podcast, episode 18, with me, Russell Hillier. And that right there was an excerpt from my talk with author, veteran of the Canadian Airborne Regiment, and bank robber, Darnell Bass. Now, hosting rogues and soldiers with a little notoriety is nothing new to this podcast, but Darnell is in a league of his own. His life story reads like a script from a Hollywood movie. Think of a mashup of Rambo, Ocean's Eleven, and Ronin. In this episode, Darnell is going to share with us the rigid and oftentimes brutal nature of training in the now defunct Canadian Airborne Regiment. He's also going to talk about the ill-fated mission to Somalia, which ended in the torture and the killing of a Somalian camp looter, the mind-altering effects of the drug mefloquin administered to Canadian soldiers on that mission, and to top it all off, he's going to give us a thorough rundown and explanation of how one goes about robbing a bank. I joined Darnell from his home in Calgary, and I'm going to start the rest of the interview right about now. Well, we'll get into that, but let's uh, let's start off at sort of at the beginning, I guess we'll say. So, the the Airborne Regiment itself is... I think it's probably safe to say that there's no other regiment or military unit in Canadian history that that is as like legendary and has so much myth and lore surrounding it as the Airborne Regiment. And, and you were a part of it. You wore the the beret, which uh, I, I don't know is that is that it right there? That's it there. Yeah. Okay. So why why do you think it is that the the Canadian Airborne Regiment has so much uh, like myth and legend surrounding it? I guess you could maybe compare it to JTF-2 or maybe like the Rangers in America. The Canadian Airborne Regiment, Russ, was not a special forces unit. That's the first thing. That's uh, what a lot of people get wrong. Um, it was a an airborne, uh, primarily an airborne infantry assault force. And uh, you, you go in by parachute, plane, or helicopter, or on foot, and uh, you're working for the commanding officer of the Canadian Airborne Regiment. Um, there was three uh, distinct units within it, which were uh, three, they were called the commandos. Right. One, two, and three commando. So that is, that's basically like, uh, could we think of a commando as like a battalion? In... No, it was smaller. It was a company. Okay. A company of a bit more, right? And in the 90s, we were always understaffed. Yeah. Yeah, that was always a, a problem. There was never enough guys. Is it fair to say that it was the elite soldiers of the army at that time or was it just russ there is no such thing as elite soldiers so let's get that straight right now that doesn't exist in my vocabulary okay i i think that is a complete myth when people use that term elite i don't like that word and i never have uh but you have guys that are very checked out yeah and professional and i mean seriously professional yeah, so each commando, I ended up from the Ars the Royal Canadian Regiment, and I volunteered in 1988, and I ended up as a private in uh, three commando. And a commando was this company size infantry element of about 100 guys, comprised mm -hmm. of three platoons, and then a, and a small headquarters element. And uh, I got, I volunteered, like everyone else, and uh, was thrown right into the shacks was posted to a platoon within three commando called 12 platoon. They had a reputation as the dirty dozen. And so the way, the way it starts. 
Yeah. That reputation of the dirty dozen, where, where, where did that come from? Like, what was that all about? Well, it just, it was, it was 12 platoon and then, yeah. and then people started calling it the dirty dozen. Right? Gotcha. You know, and yeah. then you had a whole bunch of different characters within the platoon and within the commando. Yeah. And, uh, I quickly realized once I got into three commando that this is no shit. This is no shit soldiering. This is, this is serious. You're, you're. You're prepping to jump out of planes. You're going into drop zones uh, all over Canada or North America. And uh, the intensity was there, especially with the PT in the mornings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that came across in the book. Uh, you, you write about the, uh, the, the PT, which was like, seemed pretty, uh, pretty hardcore. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it's a good wake-up session in the morning. Yeah. You know, it's uh, standard runs and then uh, push-ups and chin-ups until you're you can't do them anymore. Yeah. Sit ups. But that's that's the life of a paratrooper. You know, fitness is number one. Right. So it's it's interesting. Whenever I, I do these podcasts with uh, with Canadian veterans, it almost always comes like the Airborne Regiment always comes up in conversation. Like even if it's even if we're not talking about the Airborne Regiment, we're talking about something else, the Airborne Regiment always comes up. I think even to this day, soldiers who are you know who who weren't even a part of the regiment? They they still feel strongly about it because I think it represented something in the Canadian Army. It 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 did. It was uh, it was a unique unit stemming from World War II, um, and we also had uh, the French element, one commando from the Van Dus, the Royal Twenty Second, and so it, that was what made it very unique. Is they were they were staffed and recruited right from the Van Dus, <clears throat> um, but I think the 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 myth of the Canadian or the mythos of the Canadian Airborne Regiment has grown a little bit too much. Uh, here we are in 2020, coming up on the end of 2020, and a lot of people are still talking about this. But uh, yeah, there was not a lot of friends in. Uh, Canada that were friends of the Airborne, and I specifically mean Ottawa, NDHQ staff officers, and yeah. the political leadership. And there was people that didn't even know anything what is the, the role of the Canadian Airborne Regiment mm-hmm. until we came on scene and were sent to Somalia. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that the, the mythos of the regiment has grown over time, and you know, you, you can go to, uh, like, I think any army surplus store in Canada and you can get, like, your, you know, the, the replica Airborne Regiment t-shirts. And so so definitely, like, the mythos has has grown and, and expanded over time, I think. There's a, there's a, the reputation of, of the regiment was that it was a, it was a place where, like, people who, like you said, were really switched on got placed in. And also... I don't know if this is true, but it's been told to me by by veterans that it was a place where, like, if somebody had like an attitude problem, they might get dumped in the regiment. Is, is that true? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, if there were some very aggressive guys in there, you know, and then coupled that with alcohol and fighting, so you you got sorted out real quick, right? And uh, there was what I also enjoyed about that was a, there was my fellow soldiers wouldn't take any shit from anybody. So sometimes you were, I think that the command at the time with the various commanding officers, they had a hell of a time. You're dealing with a pack of, of wild dogs and you got to literally beat them yeah. to get in, to get them in line, right? So. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. Yeah, you, yeah, this is, uh, it was serious. So it, 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 it was a, a, a great unit. There was embarrassing times when, you know, within all units, mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, even when I was in one RCR, I, I saw some very embarrassing moments and I, I realized just what I was getting myself into here. Like, are you, are you talking about like, uh, like the hazing rituals or? Well, hazing rituals are one, you know, a lot of the guys didn't trust the command element to weed out those guys that got in. So we had to take it upon ourselves. Yeah. I, I myself didn't participate in hazing, but I was the, the hazed one at, at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, making guys drink until they literally go unconscious, you know, or, or you know, scaring the shit out of some of the new guys. 
making yeah. him give an M14 rifle a blowjob in the shacks. You know, that, that quickly wakes people the fuck up. This is what you're dealing with. So if you want to send guys into battle via parachute and you need to get a job done, this is the unit that you need. Yeah. Right? This isn't a fancy door kicker gunfighter uh, school. Well, let's leave that for the SF guys. Mm -hmm. This is uh, airborne infantry. Hard chargers, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. Very much so, you know. Yeah. You know, and I, I met a lot of very professional men in 3 Commando, outstanding soldiers. Some of them are, are dead now. Yeah. You know, a lot of the guys that come to mind that I met when I was a private, when I got there, were the jump master parachute instructors, mountain operations instructors, patrol pathfinder trained, ranger qualified, uh, sniper. And uh, on top of that, they had the whole leadership element. You know, Tom Ahern comes to mind, uh, Huey McReynolds. Uh, Dave Preper, all of these guys, you know, yeah. Mike Perkins, uh, you know, Carl DeRoche. Again, when I was a young, you know, I, I got there when I was uh, 20, when you start to hear all that. And then you start to see the leadership of the Airborne, uh, guys, field captains that had been in for 8, 10 years and are still leading platoons. Right. You know, Ranger qualified, PPF qualified, advanced recce at the time. Yeah. All of these, you know. Was this like a, a regiment that people wanted to get into? Like, was it was it hard to get into this regiment? Was the competition... No, you could volunteer. You had to be parachute qualified, uh, pass a PT test. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. Put your paperwork in. Yeah. Now, there was a lot of uh, enemies of the Airborne, and people would shit on the unit um, because they, they didn't make it or they didn't get their qualification to get in. Some sour grapes. Always, yeah. You know, there's always that inter-unit rivalry. Yeah. Um, but then some guys would get there and realize, this isn't for me. I'm getting the fuck out of here. Right. And it, it isn't for everybody. And even myself, when I got in, I was like, Jesus Christ, when you, you're walking down a gravel road, you know, and you're watching the sun go down and then the sun's coming up and you're, you're still walking down this gravel road. Yeah. You know, you've been going all night with, you know, with canteen water breaks and things and you're like, Jesus Christ, what am I doing here? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you if there was any, ever any moments where, where you're like, holy shit, what did I get myself into with this regiment? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, there was, um, there was one drop that we did where we went to rank and inlet, and it was minus 42 when the three commando jump, jumped in. And it, it was so cold that the parachutes would literally snap and crack in the air. They would make that snapping sound. And what sticks out in my mind of that jump in there, when we hit the ground, the whole three commando was there, standing there, literally frozen solid. Guys were standing on top of their rucksacks to keep their feet from freezing and walking in spot and and uh the co at the time he he had to get us moving right or we were gonna just go we were gonna freeze to yeah. yeah you know you're coming out of a nice warm aircraft and then yeah. you jump into minus 42 and, and i'm sure that feels uh even colder yeah. when you're falling uh yeah. yeah it was you know man against the elements uh yeah type thing there there was no enemy you know yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the the, tra the training just like in itself seems uh, like really hardcore, and it would I would imagine the training would weed out the people who would probably weed out a lot of people. You know, once you once you get on into the unit, you 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 uh, you you sort of mature. Because I I got there at a very young age, and then I started to to realize, okay, this is what's going on. Give it time, and when you get to the airborne, you're told first year, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Second year, kind of ask questions. Third year, okay, now you can put in input. Now you, you've got some some training. So. Yeah, you've sort of proven yeah. yourself. And, yeah, you follow that, right? Yeah. What sticks out in my mind of that first year was that we would immediately, we were using live ammunition. Yeah. A lot. And I mean, you, you had full, full battle loadout, and you're jumping mortar rounds trapped to your rucksack, 60 millimeter, and you're, you're moving into a, a commando size ambush position in Meaford, for example. Yeah. Live fire. Yeah. Yeah, live ammunition. So, so you, were, you were in the Airborne Regiment for, I guess, like about four years, and then the Somali mission. What happened? Comes up. So I did MOI, passed, 
got back to Petawawa in 90, and then it was immediately course loaded onto Patrol Pathfinder course 9001. And I actually walked into the shacks where I lived and checked the notice board, and there was my name on the course loading. That's how I found out. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. You know, I, I want to get my feet up for a week and kind of relax. Yeah. You know, tuck into some uh, fresh food. Yeah. And now I'm, I've got to pack my shit and go on the PPF course. And now this is even more serious. Now you're dealing with a very aggressive patrolling unit. Advanced reconnaissance, drop zone set up, advanced of the airborne. So I was like, oh Christ. So I showed up uh, for the, the first um, morning of the course. I think my course was about 62 days. Mm-hmm. September, started mid-September and ended uh, just, just before Remembrance Day. Right. So all of October and most of September. And you realize quickly, as a corporal, I and this is a leadership course, uh, the Patrol Pathfinder course, and uh, I, I, I had a, a vague idea of what Recky did. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of guys want the course so they can go get free fall. So then you can go, you know, you can go and join the uh, Skyhawks after once you yeah. have a free fall course. Sure. You know, the, they, they would call them the Shithawks or the Fallen Faggots. <laughs> uh, but I wasn't interested in, in, in doing a tour with the Skyhawks. In fact, I, I think the Skyhawks should be completely disbanded. Uh, but that's just me. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm set up for operational role. Mm-hmm. I'm not here for... Uh, not, not fun games. Not for the stampede. No, yeah. no, no jumping with smoke grenades attached to your feet. Yeah. So anyways, I, I got there and the first morning was the PT test, standard airborne regiment PT test. We had about 63 guys show up and I noticed there was quite a few officers uh, because they needed patrol pathfinder qualified officers. And there was one guy who was a captain from the artillery and we're standing there on inspection and the staff are literally screaming at this artillery captain. And I, and I just sort of looked over and I was like, Jesus Christ, this is serious. This is, this is a no shit patrol course. And then we... And you, and you say it because it's, it's a captain being... This is a captain yeah. and they're treating an officer of the armed forces this way. And uh, so I, I realized we're all the same. And as Canadians, you know, that still sticks with me. We're all the same. We're all here. So we get on the trucks and they drive us about 60, 55 kilometers into Quebec. And we were all, we had to walk the road individually down this road. And there was a series of stands and it took about 24 hours. It was about 50, 55 K with full rucksack, Yeah. you know, full load, you know, you know, rations and everything. And then there was, it was kind of like a, a mini selection if you want. And then we got picked up and, uh, so that was day one. So, so when did you get the news that you, that the, the regiment was being deployed to Somalia? Well, we had missed a lot of things the airborne uh they didn't send us to oka the oka crisis in quebec they didn't want us to go there there's probably a reason for that oh, right uh, there was very good reasons for that yeah uh i can understand why command didn't do that they, they so so they they knew that this was a regiment where if you sent them into a mission like uh they they weren't going to hold back no no it's no it it, it would have been bad yeah looking back at it you know i we were ready to go but, uh, you were, eh? Yeah, but soldiers are, uh, you're told what to do. Right? Yeah. And you are tasked by command. But just even the thought of the Airborne Regiment getting sent to Oka, like, yeah. holy crap, that would have been a, yeah, um, been that, a that could have been a massacre. No, knowing what did happen there with just with the police there and, and the other army units, like, it would have been a... Yeah, there was a lot of things happening. You know, I found out years later that, you know, there was there was officers that were cruising around in civilian clothing and, you know, Doing reconnaissance and that, and, yeah. You know, working with the RCMP and the QPP, you know, and it, it 
It was a mess. It mm -hmm. was a mess. Uh, that was under the... Uh, oh, what's that? I forget the Prime Minister's name. Oh, uh, Mulroney, right? Ma Brian Mulroney, yeah. that's right. So they managed to get that sorted out. I don't think that it'll ever be sorted out. But we, we missed that. So then a lot of guys... And then the Cold War thing, like I mentioned, was, was winding down. And yeah. <clears throat> there was talk of collapsing the bases in Europe and Germany. So a lot of people were disgruntled. Guys were getting out, saying, fuck it. Yeah. Literally, I, 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 I remember guys leaving driving off base saying I'm getting out of the army and because there's no hope for like seeing combat well, no. and you know guys you're in a very aggressive unit right? yeah you want to do something and then uh, we were getting ready for the Western Sahara under a United Nations uh, uh, it was a it was kind of vague but we, we did a lot of build-up work they wanted us to be mechanized hmm. for that um, and then build OPs in West Africa there was some talk of uh, demining units for the engineers and all kinds of tasks. It was a big deal. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of money invested into that, and then it all got canceled. It was a go, and then it wasn't a go, and then it yeah. was a go. And so, yeah, that was... Uh, and then we're, we're into nine, 90, 1992. 92 is when you, when you did go to Somalia. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We... We... We were tasked with that in the summer of 92 because of the famine that was going on. That was the big thing. You know, we would spend a lot of time getting our information from CNN because yeah. our command wouldn't give us any information as to what's going on. Yeah. Prepare. You know, so we were getting ready for Somalia and then we worked through the fall and then suddenly we we got the, the order to move. I, I think I received it on the, the 24th of December. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think I was in Somalia by the 26th, Boxing Day. Okay. I was in Bella Duane. Wow. So it happened yeah. It happened quickly. It did. Once we got the order to move, we were, we were supposed to go uh, to, I believe it was Mogadishu, and then we were going to go to uh, the south coast of Kismayu, and we ended up in uh, the town of Bella Duane, mm -hmm. which was about 28 or 30 kilometers from the Ethiopian border northern Somalia and the running joke was it was the Petawawa of Somalia there yeah. was nothing there yeah yeah right and uh, it was a vast vast country the distances were absolutely huge to give you an example the the, the patrol area of three commando was the size of New Brunswick yeah hmm. wow that's Literally. a lot of ground it, it's massive you you can't do it yeah and it is this mostly like uh like sort of like African wilderness or like a lot of small villages and stuff or what was the, the train like? Hot as hell. Yeah. Um, dry, dusty, very impoverished. So the town that we were in, they had uh, about 10,000 people, but mm -hmm. then it, it swelled to, f I think it was 40 or 50 because of all the refugees seeking food and shelter and aid because people were starving to death. Yeah. So they congregate to urban centers right yeah right? and so Bella Duane happened to be a place near the Ethiopian border and it was near uh, the the Chinese highway which connected to Mogadishu which was about a three and a half hour drive from the town so we we went in by air C-130 we landed and went into the airstrip and then we met two commando they they had got sent in first mm -hmm. To secure the airstrip, and then three commando followed on, and we uh, dug trenches and lived in those trenches for eighteen days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the backdrop of this entire mission was that there was this famine in Somalia, and and so the the goal or the mission was to like humanitarian, basically. Is that right? Well, no, it was under an, what's called Article Fourteen, which was basically almost war. So we had the authority to do whatever we had to do to secure yeah. our area of operations. And to, so that means you can shoot back if... That's uh, right, yeah. We, you, you, if you had to open fire, uh, yeah. you know, live ammunition was issued, grenades, everything, full combat loadout. Um, I remember walking around with uh, multiple flares and uh, M72 rocket launcher. We were doing night patrols um, from our, um, our uh, a trench line into Bella Duane. 
uh, cruising around, walking around and keeping an eye on, on parts of the town. Um, we had attached to us, uh, I can't remember which special forces group, but it was uh, a guy, he was a patrol medic with SF, U.S. Army, Special yeah. Forces, Green Berets, uh, Bob Deeks. Okay. Really cool guy. Yeah. I was impressed. Yeah. By uh, American Special Forces. So that, you're, you're working shoulder to shoulder with those guys. Well, they would, they would attach themselves to our patrols. They had their own mandate yeah. uh, with they were dealing with. Uh, but they uh, were much better equipped than us. They had night vision goggles, and uh, uh, that's one thing that we we needed. Yeah. And we didn't have them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was very impressed with uh, U.S. Army Special Forces uh, in that environment. And the, uh, the other unit that impressed me, too, was the U.S. Navy Seabees, which was a, uh, a, a, a support unit, which does carpentry and... They can build airstrips and yeah, installations yeah. and build you a shack or a house or whatever yeah. you need, a hospital, yeah, nice, right? Nice. Yeah, those guys were dialed in, and they had a can-do attitude. They, yeah. they, they knew how to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. cool. So the, it was, was the goal to, like, uh, were you there basically to, uh, like, provide security for, like, the, the humanitarian effort, like the food drops, or, like, what, what were you guys actually doing there? So the reason why you send in the military is we're, we can do a variety of things, mm -hmm. right? Multifaceted. We have our own command structure. We're organized, and you, you can do, you can task patrols right down to two man, or you can have an entire commando patrol a town and secure the town, right? So I remember we did Red Cross uh, food deliveries, yeah, and uh, we would have to deliver bags of uh, grains and Unimix. Unimix is this. It's this dried mix of grains, and they pour it in water into a forty-five gallon drum that's been chopped off, and put it on a fire, and it, yeah, it, it gives you some protein, right? And so a big, big vat of a gruel, sort of, kind of like dog food, yeah. yeah but it uh, it'll keep you alive, right? yeah. And uh, and then there was the, you know the water treatment center uh, that had to be set up and secured, and so this was this was a major major deal. Yeah, totally. Because there, there was, uh, I was just reading that, like seven hundred Canadian soldiers on this mission. Like that's, that, that's like an yeah. Afghan size yeah. contingent. Yeah, we had a, we had various individual compounds, mm -hmm. all all outside of Belladwane. Once we got established over there, uh, three commando had its own uh, f fenced in wired area. Um, we had a, a large fuel depot, uh, fuel bladder site uh, for helicopter refuel. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was constantly aircraft coming and going yeah. daily from yeah. the other side of town. We had uh, we had uh, armored vehicles. You know, SF uh, guys had uh, Humvees, and so there was always something going on, and everybody was tasked accordingly. And if you weren't tasked, you were in your little wired-in compound, you know, cooking rations and trying to keep yourself uh, sane. Yeah, yeah. Right? So. And what was the uh, the local like? How did the locals see like the foreign soldiers coming in? Like, was it a, like? Did, do you think they thought it was a good thing that they were there helping, or did you, were you dealing with like people who who weren't keen on having these foreigners in their land? Yeah, they're they're the Somalians were, were quite curious, I think, initially, and then uh, you know, and then it, that that would kind of turn, you know, acceptance. Of mm -hmm. us, but we, we, we did our job and we, you know, we tried to get along. I remember trying to get along with our interpreter. You mm -hmm. know, it's very difficult. You know, you're dealing with Somalian people yeah. in an impoverished country, you know, and here's these guys show up from Canada. But there, there was, uh, you know, friction. And then within about three months, we we're like, you know what? I don't think we should be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was that attitude after about ninety days. And why? Why was that? Like you just didn't see the results on the ground, yeah, or things aren't happening. Yeah. You know, and uh, there was a lot of things happening in Mogadishu, which yeah. the Americans and a lot of other contingents, everybody would base out of there because yeah. they had the big airstrip and they had the port. Yeah, that was huge. Right? And sorry. Is the Black Hawk Down story like is that happening at the same time no. as this? Or so we're into ninety three now, January, February, March, 
April, May. And uh, we could feel the tension was changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, it's, what is it, October 3rd today? So yeah. Black Hawk Down was yesterday. Okay. The Battle of Mogadishu was yeah. actually yesterday when uh, Rangers and yeah. uh, the Dirty Boys went after um, Muhammad Farah ID. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the leader of the... Uh, was it in our area? We had the United Somali Congress. We had another uh, another group, armed group. Mostly, they were running, you know, completely rotted out Russian uh, vehicles and weapons. Yeah, and things. Uh, but such a vast area. I I don't even think I I, I saw fifteen percent of our patrol area. Myself really? personally. Yeah. 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 It was huge. Yeah, so there's no way you could... Completely, like, well, we were completely overtasked. Yeah. You've got a town of 40,000 people that are dying and rotting. Yeah. You, you've got a, you've got guys that are trying to patrol an area the size of New Brunswick. Yeah. You know, we, we couldn't handle it. No, you, 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 could, you could probably double the numbers of, of guys over there and you still wouldn't... You could, have, you could have quadrupled it. Yeah. Easily, yeah. You know, vehicles falling apart because of the terrain... Uh, no language skills. Yeah. I, I couldn't speak any any Somalian until I got there. Yeah, you know, couldn't talk to anybody. You know? Yeah. So so you say that you could feel like the tension sort of building. Uh, what what were like some of the like events that were you know maybe getting you to in well, a different headspace? Well, people started stealing supplies. You, you understand, very impoverished people, right? Rations, water, fuel, whatever they could get their hands on. You know, they they tried to steal gasoline from a fuel bladder and it burst. Wow. Yeah, for the helicopters. And uh, so they had to task guys out to stop this. Yeah. Right? And I, I remember one night in in three commando lines, I was on sentry. And I, I, I didn't mind being on a sentry at night because it was a very quiet time. And it gave you a loud... It, you, you couldn't take a break. But yeah. you, you could be alone with your thoughts. Yeah, then. that's right. And it gave you time to think. And I would... I would cruise around and I would check the machine gun bunkers. I was a master corporal at this time. So I would wander around and just make sure the guys were all right. And then I would wander the, the fence line. And on the other side of our fence line were all of these refugee huts. And there was people that would camp, were camped out around us. That people were literally with nothing. Yeah. You know, a metal pot and a, a piece of ore, emerald green plastic, you know, that the Red Cross gave them so they could build some kind of a shack yeah. or something. And um, I remember standing there, and I was looking over the wire, and I could see these little lights at ground level. And I was standing there, and I, it was dark, pitch black, and I had a pair of night vision goggles. The sentries got that. And I brought it up to my eye, and I'm looking at this light, and I'm seeing these little flashes of light. And at first I thought it might have been some type of bugs or insects. And it was only about 30 meters away, but I, I couldn't figure it out what these little lights were. Mm -hmm. And it really bothered me. And then it stopped. It's like spooky almost. It was. It was very strange. It was these little, very tiny little lights. And so the next morning, I marked the spot on the wire, and I, I went to this guy. His name was Doug Shepard. He was another master corporal in my platoon. He was from Cape Breton. And I said, Doug come with me, I, I can't figure this out. And he was mystified too. And we went to the spot, and it, the, the sun's coming up, and there was this woman, Somalian refugee woman, in her ramshackle little lean-to with a flint and steel trying to get a fire going. Wow. And that's what the sparks that's what were. That's, and that's what I, what I saw. And I was like, whoa. So then Doug and I were like, okay, we're going to get a ration box. We're going to do the nice uh, yeah. humanitarian thing. So we loaded up with matches and some crackers and some salt and pepper yeah. and from the rations. And we walked out the wire. We put it by her, her hut there. And it was gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, that, that, that's like, those are the stories that like that I don't think Canadians heard a lot of yeah. from that mission. Like the, the yeah. good work that was done. Yeah. Because, because yeah. of course, like it was all overshadowed by the death of... I forget the, the kid's name, but... Uh, Shadane. Shadane Aron, I think. 
Did, did you yeah. did you guys was that like part of your commando or is that like a different? That was uh, two commando. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They two commando did an excellent job over there. Very professional guys. But the problem is, is you, again this back to this overtasking thing. You got a guy. You got a hundred guys trying to control a town of forty thousand people. You got forty thousand trenchers armed with everything under the the moon. People are cruising around. This is a like a society that's collapsed. Yeah. And you you want two commando to 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 sort it out? Again, a complete failure under command. Yeah. Command should have said this is unacceptable. We are stopping this. This is what we're doing. They should have been telling headquarters what to do. Yeah. You know, holy fuck. This was massive. Yeah. A complete overtasking. And, you know, I'm being naive when I was. I was only a master corporal there. But once we got on the ground and we started to look around, we were like, man, we're, we're doing nothing here. We don't have enough resources. We, mm-hmm. you know, what, what is this? Is this a parade? So this, is, uh, this was significant. Yeah. Was the population armed? Like, would it be common to see, like, uh, you know, local Somalis, like, driving around with, you know, in their trucks with... Their, their weaponry and oh, yeah. they're I mean, like yeah. posturing sort of... Uh, yeah, this is a lawless land. You know? Yeah, I, I'm just like, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking ooh. chaos. And I'm thinking, well, well it wasn't really chaos, but I, see, but we, I was wondering, like, why are we even seizing these weapons from these people? They're going to need these weapons to defend themselves, right? But we would set up roadblocks, uh, do vehicle searches on the main highway to Mogadishu. Orders came down because people were traveling the main highway down to Mogadishu from this area. So we had to, we set up roadblocks and we would seize weapons, you know, everything, small arms, G3s, RPKs, AKs, yeah. uh, SKS, you name it. Smorgasbord of uh, weaponry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all yeah. kinds of stuff, you know. And then we would also run into a lot of drug dealers um, with all their, uh, the uh, drug uh, cat and large sums of money. So small. what was that cat? Cat, it's a, it's a plant that they grow. Okay. In that part of the world, yeah. yeah. So yeah. some just some kind of like hallucinogenic drug. Yeah, it or... is. It's a mild sort of sedative. They stuff yeah. their face with it in their in yeah. their mouth, and then they they chew it. It's gotcha. Like taking a bottle of aspirin and sucking on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, yeah. We would meet we would meet drug dealers, and then you know, and then we would also uh, you know, the criminal element over there is just trying to survive. You know. Right. Right. <laughs> When, when did things uh, sort of start to go sideways? What like did, did you guys hear about um, like when when Shadane Aron was killed, and there's like more break-ins and stuff into the compounds? What, when did that when did that start? Happening? Well, that was that's I wasn't with two commando. I was with three commando, and um, so you didn't hear they, a lot about it. No, that. no. I, we we're all tasked. We're all busy. Yeah. You've got hundreds of guys. Everybody's going, doing their individual tasks at unit level. <clears throat> and if you weren't tasked, you were back in your your small compound. And all of the compounds were separate. Mm-hmm. This was a mistake that command had made. It should have been one large compound for the entire Canadian Airborne Regiment. But again, lack of resources. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. Navy Seabees, they can only do so much for us, right? Right. You know, they had bulldozers. They would make a plot of land and they would make us tent platforms. But we started to hear that there was, uh, the guys were uh, ambushing thieves trying to get into the wire, which was every night. Yeah. Twice a night. Yeah. You know, people having a go at it. and they had For to, your compound too? Well, they would try and get in. Yeah. Um, but the, the big prize was the helicopter area because that was where the, the fuel bladders were yeah. and there was bulk rations and water. And uh, so... Everybody's trying to steal something. Yeah. Right. And uh, they'll have a go at it. They have no choice. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it was completely collapsed. At this point in the podcast, we took a brief intermission to refill our teas, uh, get our bearings. Now, in this next segment, Darnell is going to talk about the disbandment of the Canadian Airborne Regiment and his new mission to rob $385,000 in cash from a Brinks armored vehicle. And just before we get there, here's a little shout out to Road Coke, Derek, Christian Nibera, new followers to the podcast. Gentlemen, thank you for your support. 
Okay, so let's get back to the interview. Here's part two of my talk with Darnell Bass. You were telling me that you were going to tell a story about a guy named Mike Yable. Yeah, yeah, Mike Yable was a, uh, he was a fellow uh, airborne soldier who was very professional. He was actually on my patrol pathfinder course and he graduated with me in 1990. And uh, excellent reconnaissance soldier. And then he, he got sent back to the, the platoons in three commando. And I ended up in the platoons in three commando as master corporal. And we, uh, we, we ended up in Somalia. And what had happened is, as I, I went to, it was up and around April and I had, everybody was entitled to a 14 day leave from the country. Mm -hmm. So I opted to go to Tanzania. I went to, uh, to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Sweet. And I, you know, I went to Nairobi, Kenya, and I, I, I got myself sorted with a bit of an outfitter. He gave him some money, and he had organized everything and got myself down to uh, uh, Moshi in Tanzania. And I, I, I was on the mountain when all this happened. I didn't see any of this, so I just heard this secondhand. But what had happened is, is that Mike, uh, there was an ND, a negligent discharge, by another uh, master corporal who was visiting in a tent, and his rifle went off, and it uh, it killed Mike instantly. Brutal. So this is what happens when you. These things happen in all armies. Yeah. NDs happen, so that's why we stress safety. You know, you're in country. You know, you're eating ration packs for months on end. And, uh, you know, there's lapses of judgment. Yeah. A lot lack of sleep, too. Like, you're the stress that you're under. Like, it's... Yeah, yeah. you're in a tent. You're in a very rough place. Yeah. But that's no excuse. So, anyways, Mike was shot and killed. They did what they could. We're in Bella Duane. And uh, I heard this story almost a year later, and I was just shocked. And it's it's always bothered me since, but there was another soldier. His name was, he was a sergeant. His name was Mike Johnson, a very professional uh, soldier. And he was very good friends with Mike Abel. And uh, they had done a lot together. And uh, they were a good, they were, they, were, they were good friends. So command decides, well, Mike Johnson is going to escort Mike Abel's body back to Canada. So they, they took him to the airstrip in a body bag, put him on a C-130 and flew him to Mogadishu. Ends up, Mike ends up in Mogadishu with Mike Abel's body on the tarmac with no way home. So Mike is sitting there and he can't figure this out. No one's helping him. And he sees a group of, I believe they were the 82nd Airborne f a company from, they were from Cairo, yeah, Egypt. And they were assembling and he saw the Maroon Berets. So he went over and he, he spoke to them, to the loadmasters of this uh, C-130 and said, hey, where are you guys going? I got I to gotta, I gotta get to Canada. And they said, no, we're going to Cairo. And then the, there was a colonel who saw Mike speaking to him and, and asked Mike, who, who's that in the body bag? And he goes, well, that's my friend. He's an airborne soldier. Well, someone get this man a drink. So they said, you're coming with us. So they, they put Mike and Mike on this C-130 and end up in Egypt, Cairo. Yeah. And he's stranded there. And now Mike's got to figure out how he's going to get from Egypt to Canada. So he ends up, the U.S. Air Force comes to the rescue again, and they get him to Germany. And then from Germany, he somehow ends up in Washington. Wow. District of Columbia, yeah, D.C. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Compliments of the U.S. Air Force. Finally manages to get onto a landline. This is before cell phones. Yeah. Phones Trenton, speaks to a duty warrant, and says, hey, I'm down here with my friend who's rotting. What the fuck are you guys going to do for us? So they sent a plane down. Wow. And they got him, and they got him home. They got Mike home. That took like a week. 
what the hell is what kind of breakdown is happening where well, a this Canadian is, soldier is well this is what happens in when you're dealing with large scale moves and armies right you know uh, they're more concerned about the unit than the individual right right so there was no preparation there was no uh, help along the way you know and this is the second uh, this is the first time i heard this this actually happened to a, a guy a sniper who was left behind in croatia I heard this story too, who was left behind by his battalion out in a Serbian occupied zone, completely abandoned. Really? Yeah. So, you know, Canadians have a history of abandoning our own fucking people. Yeah. Dead or alive. Brain dead. Well, so, it, just... that story has always bothered me. It, it is. And I'm telling it secondhand. I don't know if it's fully. Uh, fully honest but I've, I've heard it so many times so anyways I was I was coming off Kilimanjaro I spent about five or six I just think five days there and I managed to make my way back to Nairobi and I, I checked into some hotel and there was CNN there it was a hotel where a lot of the troops would would finish off their leaves right and so you could and it was good because you could get some fresh food there they had a they had a pretty good restaurant and uh, so we always liked that to get some fresh eggs and fruit and things. So, <clears throat> and and of course there was a bar where everybody would congregate. And anyways, I <clears throat> I I go to my hotel room and I see on CNN because I was a big CNN fan at the time. You know, Canadian troops are being accused of racism and murder in Somalia, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Really? So that's how you heard about that's it? That's how I heard about it in a hotel room in Nairobi, Kenya. So I went down to the bar, and I ran into a guy who was a he was a padre assigned to the Nairobi, and he said, Mike's dead. Mike Abel's dead. He's gone. Wow. And I was just like, what the fuck is happening? So I ended, up, I ended up going back to Mogadishu on a flight, and then I met three commando. They had torn down the camp by then. Really? Yeah, it was me, and uh, our tour was done. Orders back home. So, so the tour ended, like, very prematurely then? No, uh, it was six months. Okay. It was... It was yeah, it was just, just coming so up. So you just have like months. an end of tour guess, leave. Yeah, basically. command said that's yeah. enough, pull them out. Wow. It's it's over. You know, and then I guess I guess the media started to freak people out in, in command headquarters in uh, in DHQ. Yeah, because of the death of the sh of sh Shadena Roan. Well Shadena Roan was a looter and uh, he got he got caught. Um, you had guys in two commando who were uh, both uh, natives from Western Canada. Yeah. Who went fucking nuts. Yeah. You know, superior attitude. We have a prisoner. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a guy, uh, a young uh, private, who's under control of a senior master corporal. And I'm going to tell you something. When you're in the airborne and the old guys tell you to do something, you're fucking doing it. Yeah. That's how it works in real the real world. Yeah. And it's it, it sounds brutal. And if anybody's never been in uniform... Uh, army or police, you listen to the older guys. Yeah, and so that it, it got right out of control. So and that so that's where it was coming from. Is the older guys were telling the mm -hmm. the more junior members like this yeah. this is what we're gonna do. The looters come in, and well, I don't know. I'm no I'm no medic or I'm no doctor, but you know we were on mefloquine. Guys are drinking. Yeah, bad diet, stress, bullshit. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it took. Do, do you think the Mefloquine, like, because there, there, there's a there's a push now amongst veterans who are on that Mefloquine drug to get awareness out that like this drug messes people up. It does, yeah. Yeah, and so I if, I suffered from hypervigilance for probably 10, 12 years. Yeah. You know, and I I managed to deal with it. Yeah. You know, I was just you know you're always switched on, hyper you know alert. Okay, what's going on? Yeah. But there, there's there's no question that that sort of messed with people's minds. And do you think that that actually had an effect on, you know, people like Clayton Matchy who... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, no one in their right mind would fucking do that to another human being. You know, there's rules of conduct, especially with capturees. You know, you're dealing with a, a aggressive airborne soldiers, but it's the guy's disarmed. There's no need to, to torture the guy. Yeah. 
Was was it just the one guy who was tortured, or did that happen like a, a few times with uh, looters coming into the camp? I, I, no, no, everybody was detained, handed over to the military police. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, we had to take care of, uh, of of detainees too, and I always wondered where 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 is Foxhound in all this? Not enough military police over there. Yeah. You know, no clear rules from command. Yeah. You know, we shouldn't have been dealing with that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, when you when you left Somalia, when the tour is over, did you guys have any idea that there was like some serious political shit brewing on in Canada mm-hmm. and and that yeah. and that. Yeah. Uh, there was going to be some ramifications. Well, we did. I didn't know it was going to be that bad, but I, I knew uh, we're we're getting out of here, and we we arrived back in Petawawa. I think it was in the end of May. It was quite cold, and we arrived at ten o'clock at night. And got off the bus and get the fuck out of here. Go to your barracks or go home. Yeah, yeah that was it. That was the end of the uh, tour. No, no homecoming. No, uh... fuck no, 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 yeah. no. No debrief, no uh, patrol debrief, nothing. Yeah. So I was like, geez, this is very strange. But I just wanted to get into the mess hall or yeah. know, get a restaurant meals. And, yeah. and then they cut us loose for a month's leave. When you got, when you got back to Canada and, and the, the months are rolling on, were you, were you like paying attention to the news and the stories that oh, were coming absolutely. out? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Of course you are. Any, every time... You know, the CBC would paint a picture, and it was just on nonstop for two years. Yeah. Nonstop, like, we were the bad guys. Yeah. And so you are the bad Canadian. And once you're the bad Canadian, you're fucked. Yeah. Yeah. There's no letting go. Right. Yeah. And we're very good at that as Canadians. Yeah. We yeah. need to identify who is the bad Canadian. These are the bad Canadian, and we're going to deal with them. Right. Yeah. Especially under the Liberals. Well, yeah, yeah. They, they this was, uh, you know, the the decade of darkness, anyways. And mm-hmm. uh, of course, like I think that the Airborne Regiment probably didn't really fit the liberal idea of what a military should be, because a little, yeah. a little too aggressive, a little too switched on. Well, they, well, you're throwing us into an environment into East Africa, a collapsed society, yeah, third world nation, filled with every type of a uh, uh, Russian. Uh, Cold War weaponry you can get your hands on. The Italians had to flee that country. Yeah. You know, they did their best. You know, completely tribal based or criminal based. Right. You know, and then you have your, 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 just your general people, farmers and everyone else just trying to get by in that country. Oh, this was a bad mix. Yeah. And then you had a huge overriding, everything's going to go to United Nations and we're, we're all going to be uh, friends in the 90s. And then Rwanda started, and a massive massacre. Yeah, right. You know, and they should have, then they sent a platoon of the Airborne over there. I didn't go. They did, eh? I didn't, they I didn't did. know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A small platoon to guard medical people and stuff. Yeah. 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 So did you guys sort of see the writing on the wall that, like, no. this regiment was going to be disbanded? No, no. I, I wasn't in the know. I lived in Petawawa, yeah. so I didn't have a lot of contacts. I just, I was a soldier. I lived in the shacks for 10 years. Yeah. I did what I was fucking told to do. Right. That's what you do as a soldier. Yeah. So yeah. You, you're aware of the news, uh, but you're you're not really thinking about it much. No, I didn't think. And in fact, I I I was naive because I believed in Canada. I used to believe in the monarchy, and I was a proud Canadian. Yeah. But all of that disappeared within about ninety seconds. In that 90 seconds, I'm sure it was in the year 1995 when the regiment was disbanded. That's right. When that announcement was made on January 28th by Minister of Defense David Colonnette. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how what was the reaction? Like, I had imagined there Complete was... Complete disgust. Yeah. Shock. I actually... I When that happened, we marched off. We did our final jump March 5th. We laid up the colors with uh, Colonel Kenward, uh, Patrol Pathfinder Platoon as usual, led the way. Yeah, that was a very... That's the final sad, parade. That was the final parade. We, uh, I actually went to my room and I wept. Yeah, I wept alone in my room in the shacks. And I didn't... I, I, I was lost. I was like, that's it. Yeah. But it, my reality was completely shattered. It, at, at that point, that was it. Yeah. Okay. Because, because the, the army... When you're in the army, it's, that, that is your identity. 
Well, and, and and it's uh, you're in a situation suddenly where your entire identity is almost like stripped away, oh, yeah. and it, and it's your own government who's doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the bad guys have been dealt with. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we're still here. We are, you know, uh, twenty five years uh, later. We're still we're still talking about this. Yeah. Well, and that, that just goes to show, like, this is how we started the program, is, like, mm -hmm. the myth, the legend of, of the Airborne Regiment, and, and it's probably... So, yeah, removed from the Order of Battle, removed from the Canadian Force, the, the colors were laid up in the museum, and uh, everybody, fuck right off. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, just I, like, sort of like a scattering to the, the four corners, like, did a lot yeah, of guys... Yeah, a lot of guys got out, a lot of guys were, we were placed in holding units in Padawawa, and guys... Guys back went back to Valcarche, one commando, PPCLI. The two commando guys went back to PPCLI out west here. <clears throat> three command, uh, three commando guys. And at the time, Germany had closed down previous to that, so there was a lot of people coming to base Petawawa. Yeah. And so we were getting guys coming in, and they're they're coming from Germany, and they were. I was talking to some of these guys, and they're like, "I'm not fucking staying here. Yeah. This is brutal." I was living a first class lifestyle yeah, in yeah. Germany. <laughs> I had two cars yeah. and I'm I'm living here. Yeah. Fuck this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Yeah. Well, when uh when the regiments disbanded and like people are sort of going their own ways, uh you stayed in the army. Right? I did. Yeah. yeah. I ended up uh spent a year with a uh light infantry battalion. Yeah, they were starting up the jump companies within three RCR. And uh, I quickly found out that the jump companies are a complete fucking joke. Um, parachute trained infantry within the battalions. Yeah. You know, you've got about uh, 90 guys that are, you know, but that, it, 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 it just immediately died. Right. The whole aggressive spirit. Yeah. So, you you yeah. couldn't replicate it. In, uh... That's right. So I ended up uh, stumbling around base for a while. And then I... Uh, my sergeant major at the time, Jimmy Vigneau, he, he asked me, he goes, would you like to go to Israel? And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go on this UN yeah. tour and cool off a bit. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going to northern Israel to the Golan Heights for six months as a training uh, master corporal. Mm -hmm. And so I was attached to the operations center of that small base. There was a small Canadian base that provided logistics and it had a few uh, combat arms people running it. So I was attached to that yeah. in the operations center. It was an easy tour for me. Yeah, I, I did have responsibilities over there. And uh, yeah, right, me. right. So, so Jordan, how how did you get from peacekeeping mission or advisor in Israel to this attempted heist of the Brinks armored vehicle in Calgary? So. So what, like, what happened there was uh, I got back from Israel and I came back to Calgary and I, I met up with this guy that I knew and was friends who was working for Brinks at the time. His name was Patrick Ryan. And we kept in touch over the years. And I'm pissed. I'm still pissed. I'm like, fuck. You know, what just went down here? You know, I'm back in Petawawa, back in 3RCR. So he actually approached me and said, hey, you want it? You want in on a job? We're going to start taking down some ATM machines. And I said, I thought about it for ten seconds and said, Yeah, I'm in. Yeah. So looking back, is I wanted revenge. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to even the fucking score here for the disbandment. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And you taken from me? Well, fuck you. I'm taken from you now. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. And immediately when I made that decision, everything got real clear because now I'm working for me. Yeah. I'm not working for command. Mm -hmm. This is great. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for me. <laughs> yeah. Not thinking of the consequences at all. Yeah. So then operational planning got into effect. How does one ar uh, do an armored car ambush? And so it all culminated on March 19th, yeah. 1998. Okay, so... I would imagine that uh, the preparation involved in pulling off this heist probably like you, you must have you must have dug into like some of your military training. Well, and... I took a look at it, and I uh, you know how does one do this? And, uh, so how how does one do this? Well, it, that's if you have someone who 
works at Brinks and who knows their procedures of the ATM load-ups and who uh, has acquainted with all their procedures, you have an in. Right? Yeah. But he, Pat, Pat was looking for some backup on this. He needed a partner. So I volunteered. Yeah. It was the second time in my life that I volunteered. And so now I'm volunteering for crime. And I immediately realized, this is work. You have to put forth the effort. This is not easy. You need money to do this. You need planning. And this takes time. Yeah. And it, if, you, if you have to do this correctly. So uh, all of these three things, and it was like mounting an operation. So we're like, Jesus Christ. So we took a hard look at this, and then we, we went for the, the March 19th heist. That was the big one. There was three hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars being brought in in cash and coin yeah. into the CIBC up at the North Hill Mall. Yeah, and so because your your partner he was working for the company, so he knew he knew all the ins and outs, and yeah. he had he he could uh, he could debrief his fellow employees to get more information. Yeah, subtly. Yeah, you know his girlfriend at the time was there. Mm -hmm. yeah, he brought her. He bought her breast implants to make her happy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe make him happy. <laughs> so, you know, there was a whole cast of characters going on here. Yeah. It's, it's March 98, is it? Uh, it what, was, what happens on that day when you're like, this is the day yeah. where we're going to do it? Well, what we did is I came out. I flew out from Petawawa and, uh, under another name and uh, landed in Calgary. I had all the weapons and ammunition, tear gas, uh, pre-assembled and sent out okay. by courier. Yeah. And so it was all picked up. I was in a hotel room. And we started laying out the equipment, what we're going to do. We walked the mall yeah. to figure out what's going on. What, you know, I had to figure out what was going on in this building. Take a look around. And this was the big job. We had attempted a, a few others before this, mm -hmm. uh, which we had pulled the plug early yeah. because there was too many personnel involved. Um, we were also contemplating a full-on attack of the Brinks uh, headquarters in Calgary with a ring main charge where we would just blow the roof off. Yeah, uh, blow a hole in the roof and then drop ladders down and then get into the main vaults. But we we looked at that and we we're like, "Fuck, yeah, we got to start shooting people here." Yes, yeah. this, this is this, which is not what you wanted to no, do. No, no. The idea here is to sneak this, pull this off, and get away clean. That you don't want bloodshed. You don't want casualties. So this is, you know, armed robbery in Canada is no joke because it, it's life in prison. Yeah. So, uh, but I wasn't thinking that. You, you're not thinking about the consequences and sequels of what you're doing, right? Yeah. Because in order to achieve, you provide teamwork, you put forth the work, you will be successful. Yeah. This is one thing that I've learned. If you have teamwork and people working mutually together for one common ideal or goal, it's going to happen. And it, it's it's. You know, that's why armies are created. Well, this is a lesson right from the army, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So I, yeah, we, we had a, we had a, uh, we had a rental van and, uh, so the plan was we would, uh, go into the North Hill Mall dressed up as Brinks guards mm -hmm. and, uh, I had full uniform provided to me, concealed body armor, I had a 45, 1911, two knives. Uh, Styrog assault rifle, uh, 10 magazines, a uh, complete change of clothes, coveralls. And so we went into the CIBC, and the idea was to get into the bank and uh, wait between about 9.30 to 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. Because we were going to ambush the crew coming in to do their deliveries right. and drops for the ATM machines. And so Pat had previous knowledge that they were bringing in 385,000 bucks. So this is the payoff and I'm the fuck out of the country. I'm, I'm leaving. This is, this is my thinking at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> so we got into the, the, the bank, uh, Pat had a key and in the bank was a cleaner doing his night cleanups. And he's having a conversation with me, and I'm standing there with this large kit bag filled with uh, everything to go to war with. 
And he's like, what's up? And I said, look, you can't be here. I, we need to fill these ATM machines up. Yeah. So he's like, okay, well, I'll get out of here. And he was good about it. He, I wanted him the fuck out of there now. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I wasn't disguised or anything. Yeah. And so he leaves with his janitor uh, station cart. <clears throat> and uh, he waves goodbye through the accordion doors, and I wave back. Mm -hmm. So now we're in the bank. It's about quarter to ten. We go into the bathroom, and we change out of our brace uniforms, and we put on coveralls. Yeah. Full chest rigs. Uh, 45, Styrog, round up the spout. And uh, now we position ourselves in and around the main entrance, concealed. I was in a storage file room, and we waited. Yeah. We were going to wait there till 5 a.m. If nobody showed up, well, we're going to go out the back door, yeah. and we're leaving. We'll go for breakfast. So I sat in this room, and something in my head said, Get the fuck out of here right now. And the other side of my head said, no, be cool, stay here. Mm -hmm. So I have these two conversations going on in my head. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, I, I'll never forget it. I had a, a, a wristwatch sewn to the back of my glove, and it was a, a, a Timex, and uh, it, it said 10, 50, or 23. 53 seven minutes to midnight and mm -hmm. I heard the door open and I was like too late now it's, yeah it, it, this is going down yeah so I stood up and I pulled my mask down and I peered around the corner and I could see these two brace guards coming in with a, a dolly loaded up with gray bags filled with money and I thought yeah, here we go and I stepped out of the room and the, the first brace guard who was actually armored by the way, who was an ex armored forces guy yeah. who has worked for Brinks. Uh, his name, I actually spoke to him later. His yeah. name was Paul DeSong. He, he looked at me and his eyes went huge like saucers. He, I'll never forget these brown eyes. Yeah. And I'm standing there, and before I can say anything, he draws his pistol and immediately fires. He fired. And the, the round went high, it went over my head. Uh, I found this out later. And it set off the uh, sound alarms within the branch. And it smashed through a wall into the vault, which has also got a sensor system right. on it. And so Honeywell, all the gauges are now at Honeywell security going on max. Well, I immediately reacted. And I started pouring bullets over Paul's head. I had a bead on his chest. I had him dead to rights with that rifle. And I pulled my shot at the last second. Yeah. It's something that I... I don't know why I made that decision, but it was my decision. And I... I did that. Yeah. So I started pouring bullets over his head to win the firefight. To, to get him out of there, basically. Well, no, to, to stop him from shooting yeah. at me. Well, it worked. So he f flew in behind some office desks, and I started to shoot and blow away all the glass. I had a 40-round magazine on that rifle, and I dumped that entire magazine within about less than 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, all this is going on. The Honeywell alarms are, are going crazy, and we had hit a, a fire extinguisher mounted on a wall, and the effluent from the fire extinguisher is going everywhere. So now it's like this smoky haze yeah. in there. Meanwhile, Pat, I had given him an, an AK-47, which was Chinese, and it had. Uh, I told him, look, I said, this is backwards. Mm -hmm. The first selector switch, it is fully automatic. Yeah. And if you go all the way down, it's semi-automatic. Remember that. Well, it, he put it on the, the fully automatic and dumped 30 rounds through the doors, through the accordion doors, through the Safeway, and it was exploding cans of food in the Safeway across the aisle of the mall. Wow. So you've got two guys dumping 5.56 five, ammunition. Uh, the Chinese AK was modified mm -hmm. to fire 5.56. Five, and so all hell's breaking loose. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck the money now. We have to get out of here now. Yeah. We are leaving. And where the money was, was right in front of uh, the Brinks guard where he could fire. The second Brinks guard at the time, I didn't know this, he had fled and thrown his gun away and was laying down prone with his hands out on the, the floor of the mall, leaving yeah. Paul Besson to fight for his own life. I found this out later from the police. And so 
I yell at Ryan, gas! He pulls a tear gas canister, throws it, and this is our escape. Yeah. It's a pretty good patrol technique because no one wants to follow you up with yeah. gas, right? They stay away from that shit. Yeah. So we had a CS tear gas canister, gas is thrown. I grab Ryan and I grab the kit bag and we were out the back door and we were in the van in this empty parking lot in March. Still snow on the ground. Yeah. And we drove away. Yeah. And that was it. That money bag, like, so close but so far away at the same time, eh? It is. I made a decision. The goal of the bank robber is to get the money. Yeah. Yes. And it's funny because when I ended up in prison, everybody asked me, did you get the money? Yeah. Even the police go, did you? <laughs> Some of them were like, and the guards. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. We made the decision to leave the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it, it's a crazy story, isn't it? It is. It's crime. And crime is brutal. And it is not uh, something to fuck around with. Yeah. And it was like I was told in the joint, you can't do time, then don't fuck with crime. Yeah. yeah and that is so true. Well, how, how long, uh, you know, you said earlier that armed robbery is a life sentence in, in Canada. That's right. So That's right. How, how long do you, did you uh, stay well, locked up for? With a gun in your disguise is four-year minimum at the time. I think it's up to five now with mm-hmm. a prohibited weapon. I'm not, I'm not fully up on the laws. Yeah. The, uh, but how much time did you spend? Uh, I pled out to seven years, and then I, uh, I became a witness. Okay. So now, you're in a very dangerous fucking game. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't get any more serious than this. You are now an airborne soldier, bad guy in Canada. You are now a bank robber. You're a bad guy, criminal. And now you become a witness, an informant. You are now three bad guys in the federal prison system. Bad fucking guy. But I made that decision. Yeah. It was such a shit show with the police and all of the psychological operations that, that Ryan had spewed that it had affected so many people and fucked up a lot of people. I said, look, I have to sort this the fuck out. We are debriefing and we are debriefing now. Yeah. And so that's how it all came about. So I ended up in... Uh, <clears throat> I was still in the army in 98 when I got arrested. I ended up in federal prison pulling seven years. Um, and I had debriefed. And I was still in uniform, it, or st- meaning I was still in the armed forces. Yeah. And I was in federal prison in um, Bowdoin here in Alberta. Right. And uh, I ended up in Edmonton Max. I pulled about five months in remand, did about just shy of 33 months in federal. But uh, when you go to federal prison, they have to do what's called a classification. So I ended up in uh, uh, Edmonton Max. I think it was J unit. Uh, They put only the most psychotic and insane, highly dangerous criminals in certain units. Well, that's where they put me. Right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No shit. So I did four months or three months in Supermax in there, uh, went through the classification, and then uh, ended up in Bowdoin. Yeah. Yeah, which is kind of a medium medium, medium, yeah. medium security facility uh, because I became a witness. And uh, there was about 70% sex offenders in that prison, mm-hmm. a lot of career criminals, uh, a, a lot of very cunning career criminals. I was quite... Yeah. Some of them I hung around with. But some of the best guys that I met in prison were uh, H.A., Hells Angels. Yeah, yeah. okay. They were okay. the nicest guys, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> they, that, that's, it's funny because like, everybody says that, right? Like uh, the Hells Angels, like, they're, they're great to have as neighbors because uh, nobody's going to fuck around with your <laughs> yeah. property. Good guys, you know. And <laughs> Just they, don't get on the wrong side. Well, they, they know the score, right? And there's a level of honesty when you get into prison. Yeah. This is what I've done, mm-hmm. and I'm fucking dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Right. But in, in the book, I called it Innocent Row. Yeah. Because everybody I met was innocent, right? No yeah. one wanted to cop to it. Except for me. I said, no, I, I did this. Yeah. But that fucked up a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, yeah. It's, uh, no, nobody wants to admit to the shit that they've done. So if, if you have yeah. somebody in there who's actually like, you yeah, know, I did well, it. Well, yeah. I put in the work to get there. And so I was paying for it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you, you spent the full seven years? No, no, I got paroled out. Uh, I got denied parole. Uh, Ryan had fled to France. He was under an extradition warrant through Interpol. Uh, they brought him back. There was a trial, and uh, he ended up getting nine years. Yeah. Yeah. He did a lot of time in the remand center pre-trial, fighting it all the way. Yeah. You know, psychological techniques with the local media here, uh, deception techniques. Every every, you know, when you're involved in crime, you're there are no rules. Mm -hmm. So you can, yeah. Yeah. But with the system the way it was, I uh, I got denied day parole first go around, and then I went in front of the national parole board for my second time. That was at about year three, and. Uh, you know, I actually have to commend the National Parole Board because they are real people and they are professional. Those people that are uh, selected, uh, they know what the fuck they're doing and they are dialed in. And I have to commend them for that. They, uh, that is no joke. Yeah. They're some of the most real Canadians that I've met. Yeah. 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 And they're, they're, they're good. So I ended up... Uh, Getting a day parole, big media circus, got released to the streets of Calgary. Uh, I f found out that they had to assign a constable full time to deal with the Crime Stoppers reports on me because of the media, and there were so many people that were scared that they were phoning in uh, that I was uh, a high risk, and so he, this constable so had to deal. Yeah. Just with this. Th these are people calling the police saying like, hey, I think that Darnell guy is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. I, I heard this and I couldn't believe it. I yeah. was like, wow. Yeah. And all I was doing was riding my mountain bike around the Beltline, you know, yeah. for four months, going for teas and eating sweets and getting some food down my neck and yeah. working out. And then I, I was assigned a parole officer, federal parole officer, uh, Jimmy Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good guy. Very professional. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was no joke. Uh, very intelligent guy. Been around, right? They they, they, they know who, who's who. These uh, these parole people, and corrections. And so yeah, I remember one day I met him for a tea. I was about four or five months in, and I said, you know, let's. I said, are you busy? Because I had to check in with him once a once a week, and then it went to once a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, yeah, I got nothing going on. I I had twenty eight guys on my caseload, but. They're all gone. And I said, what do you mean they're gone? He goes, they're all back in prison. They're all violated back in for parole violations. So yeah. I was the only You're guy. the only guy. One guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I made it real easy for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I always remember that. That was, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Darnell, it's, uh, it's, it's getting to that time. It's been a really good conversation. I, I think a lot of Canadians are, are really going to, I don't know, I guess uh, have their eyes open a little bit to... You know the Airborne Regiment and your your own personal your life story is it's 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 a crazy incredible life story. Uh, you've done a lot of living, that's for sure. <laughs> so thanks again for for taking the time to be on here. Really appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. Okay. Maybe we'll do a part two one day. My first podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're gonna be famous. <laughs> twenty twenty. <laughs> okay, Darnell. All right. Thanks a lot, buddy. You're welcome. Take care. And that concludes my talk with Darnell Bass. I highly recommend getting your hands on a copy of his book, What Measure of Man, because it's a fantastic read, the story is good, it's well written, it's a Hollywood movie in waiting. I also want to thank Darnell again for his time and his hospitality, it was really good getting to know you. Now, if you like today's podcast, then I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do, and that's to go into Apple iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from, rank it, leave a review, that really helps me out a lot. Hey, you can also help out the podcast by getting a copy of my book, One Soldier, A Canadian Soldier's Fight Against the Islamic State, or The Pawns of War. I think that's it for today's episode, so I hope you enjoyed it. Share it with your friends and family. Also, if you have any suggestions for any future podcasts or comments, you can find me on Twitter or send me an email. Finally, I'm going to dedicate this episode to all the veterans of the Canadian Airborne Regiment. Out.